All right, I just want to say hello to everyone. Thank you for joining us for the MindCore seminar series. Um, I have to touch, I'm gonna to touch on just a few housekeeping uh, matters. My name is Heather Calvert. I'm the staff director for MindCore, and there's some information about us. The coming series has been pasted in the chat, chat, um, chat bar on the right. Uh, one thing for today, if you have a question um, during the presentation, it's kind of a general question. You're welcome to post it in the chat and sometimes the audience can answer it for you. You're welcome to post uh, papers of relevance that are referenced. Um, if you have a question for our speaker, it's helpful to use the ask a question button. And um, our moderator today, um, Reese DePlate, will, will ask the questions of Dr. Gopnik towards the end. So, Again, I want to just turn it over to Rista, who is um, a MindCore fellow. We are very happy to have her with us. Um, so, Rista, please. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Allison Gopnik today. Dr. Gopnik is a professor of psychology and affiliate professor of philosophy at UC Berkeley. She received her undergraduate deg degree from McGill and her PhD from Oxford. And Dr. Gopnik has received numerous distinguished honors across her career, including membership into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's published uh, many influence, influential works, spanning, of course, empirical articles, um, but she's also published a number of books and regularly contributes to popular press pieces. So I think Dr. Gopnik is this really great example of someone who's doing really good science and then getting that science out there to many readers in order to influence um, lives and especially lives of children. Uh, Dr. Gopnik's research has been instrumental in understanding children's vast abilities to reason about the world. And she was one of the first to really give young children credit for these sophisticated reasoning skills. As I think she'll talk about today, she helps us to understand the unique features of childhood and how that rel relates to our evolution as a species and how we manage the complex demands of our environments. Dr. Gopnik is really an ideal speaker for this series because of her deeply interdisciplinary approach, both in theory and methods. She integrates fields including, but not limited to, philosophy, psychology, and neuroscience to ask really big and meaningful questions about human as well as non-human minds. So please join me in, in warmly virtually welcoming Dr. Allison Gopnik. Great. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, as you may know, I was born in Philadelphia. In fact, I lived my whole childhood in Philadelphia, only a few blocks away from, uh, uh, only a few blocks away from the university on 41st and Locust Street. So I feel a deep fondness. Um, I feel a deep fondness for the place. Um, my parents were actually graduate students at Penn. Uh, so the big question that I want to talk about today is something that. Uh, we discussed in this special theme issue of the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, which is here coming soon, but is actually now out. Um, and I have a long kind of review theoretical paper in, in there about this idea about what, why do we have childhood at all? How does our childhood and what, um, what biologists generally call our life history, our developmental history, um, what role does that play in our cognition and culture and our other abilities. Um, so a way you could think about this big question is interestingly one that uh, developmental psychologists haven't actually asked all that much, which is why do we have childhood at all? Not just what happens in childhood, but why do we have childhood at all? And that's a particularly relevant question because our human uh, life history, our human childhood is extremely weird. So by the time this chimp in the Gombe is seven years old, it's actually, he's actually producing as much food as he's consuming. And even in forager cultures, human children aren't doing that until they're at least 15. And my son is 30 and we're still uh, paying, paying the rent. Um, so why is it that we have this very long period of childhood? And that period, long period of childhood is expensive in all sorts of ways. It requires a much wider range of people to take care of and invest in those, uh, invest in those children. So it's puzzling, it's evolutionarily puzzling that we would have this long period when uh, we're not producing anything. And in fact, we're using up a lot of resources from other people. 
Uh, and that question becomes even more significant and interesting because if you look across a wide range of different species, you see this systematic relationship between the a degree of immaturity, how long your childhood is essentially, and then other features like intelligence and relative brain size and flexibility. Um, and kind of the poster animals for this are not even mammals, but birds. So if you compare, say, the domestic chicken, uh, chickens are basically very, very well designed to peck for grain, not very good at doing very much of anything else. And the capacities that they use, which are actually pretty complex to be able to do that as well, are there essentially from the time they're born. There's actually studies that show this. Um, and the chickens reach maturity in just a few weeks. If you compare that to say this New Caledonian crow, the New Caledonian crow is uh, the New Caledonian crows have amazing flexibility and cognition. They have tool use abilities that rival those of chimpanzees, for example. Um, they're very, very smart birds. They're very flexible birds, very good at learning. Um, and they're fledglings for as long as two years, which is a very long time in the life of a bird. And it turns out that if you do developmental studies, those two years actually are the period in which they're learning the things that they're going to need to be able to show these sophisticated tool use abilities later on. Um, and uh, the chart that's next to it shows you the uh, relationship for primates and you see the same relationship. The amount of weaning is related to the amount of uh, intelligence and, and brain size. In fact, a lovely study that, uh, that I really like suggests that this may be something that's really profoundly part of how evolution and biology work. So even if you look at insects, so you know, we've looked at birds and mammals, even if you look at insects, you see this relationship between immaturity and learning. So this is beautiful work by biologist Emily Snell Rood. Um, and what she did was look at different cabbage white butterflies. Cabbage whites, butterflies in general, are not very smart animals. Um, but even among butterflies, there's a distinction between how much they rely on just innate cues and how much they rely on learning. So it turns out the very hungry caterpillar tells you everything you need to know about butterfly life history. Butterflies basically uh, lay a caterpillar on a leaf. The caterpillar eats the stuff on the leaf. It turns into a cocoon and then into a beautiful butterfly and then it repeats. Um, but it turns out that some of the butterflies um, just go to green uh, food like, uh, like this kale, for example. Um, so they just seem designed to do that, then they lay their eggs and they leave. Others are pickier. So what they'll do is flit around, try different kinds of leaves, detect the degree of nutrient in the leaves, and then find a nutritious leaves. And they'll avoid leaves that already have an egg that another butterfly has laid. So they're just a little bit more involved in learning. Um, and it turns out that the butterflies that learn uh, have half as many eggs and those eggs take twice as long to mature as the butterflies who just rely on their, uh, the butterflies who just rely on their innate, um, uh, rely on their innate abilities. So that suggests that this relationship is a very, very broad ranging one across, a uh, very wide ranging one across biology. Um, and furthermore, if you actually look at human evolution, if you actually look at the fossil evidence, there's evidence for this change literally in the course of hominin evolution. So if you compare the various you know, precursors, Australopithecus and Neanderthals and so forth, you can use uh, tooth records to figure out what their, uh, what their period of immaturity was. And even if you're comparing, say, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, it looks as if Neanderthals were maturing more quickly than, uh, than Homo sapiens were. Um, so there's something that's going on about this long period of childhood uh, that seems to be very connected to the big changes in the way that, uh, in the way that Homo sapiens uh, function. And the special issue that I mentioned has a whole lot of interesting ideas about what some of those relationships uh, might be. Um, what is it that led to those changes? So if there's this really sudden drastic change in life history in humans, what was the reason for it? And there's various ideas, but the, the most common one is that what happened was that the environment became more variable and less predictable. Um, so now humans have caused climate change, but in the past, climate change actually caused humans. So. If you look at uh, if you look at the period in which humans evolved, the climate wasn't so much that it got 
colder or hotter, but it got to be less predictable. And it got to be less predictable in the course of a single uh, uh, generation of, of humans. And that ability to be able to deal with many, many different environments seems to be the thing that triggered this long period of childhood. Um, and of course, once humans began to have abilities to do things like modify their environments, have culture, have social, uh, have social development, um, that means that we actually not only exist in many more different environments than any other creature and have since we evolved. I mean, it's striking that chimps, for example, are still living in the same place as they were when they evolved and we've literally conquered the globe in outer space. We also have created a wider variety of environments. So humans have this special problem, which is trying to detect the structure of the environment that they find themselves in. And these long period of childhood, this capacity for learning uh, seems to be designed to be able to enable them to do this. And we see this as well when we actually look at uh, uh, a development, uh, when we look at brain development, this is this classic, uh, classic chart from, uh, from Peter Hattenlocker looking at synaptic development. And as I imagine everybody here knows, what seems to happen is that there's this early period when many new connections, new synapses are being formed. And then there's a kind of tipping point. The synapses that are used a lot get myelinated, they get to be stronger, they're more long distance. And the ones that aren't are pruned, classic kind of story. But I think it's interesting that there is this real difference between the early period and the later period. And if you're thinking about having an early period that's really devoted to learning, exploration, flexibility, plasticity, and then a later period that's devoted to actually going out into the world and getting things done, this kind of neural architecture makes a lot of sense. And of course, another piece that will be very relevant and people in, uh, in this audience uh, have done beautiful work on is that the frontal cortex, the part of the brain that's sort of the executive office of the brain uh, is the latest part of the brain to mature. Um, so one of the other characteristics about young humans is that they don't have this kind of frontal control. And this is often seen as just sort of a deficit, um, but as Sharon Thompson Schill and others have pointed out, there's actually a trade-off between frontal capacities and, uh, and learning capacities. So it may actually be an advantage if what you want is to learn to not have as much frontal control. And that's a point that I'm gonna get to including an empirical study uh, later on. All right, so why would you see this, uh, why would you see this developmental pattern? Why would you see this early period uh, in which capacities seem to be really different? Uh, you know, in fact, it's interesting that what that suggests is that there's something really different about adult intelligent versus intelligence versus childhood intelligence. So it may be that rather than thinking about, you know, children as sort of defective grown-ups and development as just getting to be closer and closer to this perfect adult. Um, uh, state, uh, instead we should think about it as being a process in which there are different periods with different cognitive strengths and weaknesses. And if you just think about, you know, taking a, uh, taking a, oops, what happened there? Sorry. Um, if you just think about it as, you know, taking your, your, your standard, um, think about it as just taking your standard um, introductory course in cognitive psychology, versus taking your standard introductory course in cognitive development, you'll see that the kinds of things that you study are gonna be really different. So if you take the adult cognitive psychology class, you're gonna find out about things like inference, attention, memory, planning, decision-making. Those are the kind of topics you have in an adult cognitive psychology class. Um, you aren't gonna hear very much about that in the cognitive development class. Instead, you're gonna hear about things like statistical learning, grammar induction, intuitive theory formation, uh, conceptual change. Um, so the very things that we study are really about this capacity to go out, take information from the world and make sense of it for children, and then the capacity to take that information and put it into action to actually accomplish your goals um, as far as when you're studying the, when you're studying the adult uh, system. And what that suggests, so why, again, why would we see this difference and why would we see this pattern? Well, I've been spending a lot of my time, in fact, most of my time in the past year or so, uh, interacting with people in AI at Berkeley. I'm part of the Berkeley Artificial Intelligence Research Group, and we have a big grant from DARPA to, to use what we know about developmental psychology to try and uh, understand more about, um, uh, 
uh, about learning machines. And one of the things that comes out really clearly in AI and also in neuroscience is this idea that there's a kind of trade-off between two kinds of cognitive capacities, exploitation versus exploration. So the idea is if you have a system that's trying to, that has a big multi-dimensional, high dimensional space of say possible solutions to a problem or a big high dimensional space of possible hypotheses about how the world works, um, there's gonna be a, a real trade-off between being able to act effectively and being able to consider a whole bunch of different possibilities. So if you're considering all the possibilities, here's one solution that could work, here's another one that could work, um, that you risk spending time doing things that are actually not going to be effective and you might even be risky, might even lead you to, uh, might, might even lead you to bad outcomes. Um, but if you just exploit, if you just do the thing that always worked in the past or do the thing that your current state of belief tells you is the most likely to give you the right outcome, uh, then you're likely to miss possibilities, miss strategies or solutions or hypotheses that might actually have been better or more effective ones. Um, and one of the big, uh, one of the big uh, morals of uh, computer science is that there isn't really a simple way of resolving these trade-offs. They're, they're, they're intractable trade-offs. Um, and the way that, uh, that they often get resolved in, uh, in computer science is to have an early period in which you do this exploration. Um, you start out looking very broadly through the space and then a later period in which you narrow down to a particular solution and do exploitation instead. Um, and a particular way that this gets done in, uh, in computer science is something called simulated annealing. Again, think about that high dimensional space. You could think about it as being like a big space, a big box full of potential solutions to a problem, let's say, or a big box full of potential hypotheses about the world. Um, now, you can't go through and check every single one of those solutions or every single one of those hypotheses. So you have to search through that space. And there's two different ways that you could search through the space. You're at one point in the space now, you're where, where you are with your current knowledge state. And one thing that you could do is you could do what's sometimes called hill climbing. You could just make little changes to the, uh, the solution that you already have and then test to see whether that is a better solution than the one that you've already got. Um, another thing that you could do is, so if you just do that little hill climbing where you're just doing this low temperature trying to make small changes, uh, you might very well get to a really good solution quickly, but you might miss a solution that's actually much better, but much further away, much more different from what you're currently considering. And it's easy to get stuck in what's called a local optimum. It's easy to be in a situation in which what you're doing now is better than anything that's very similar to what you're doing now, but there's actually a better solution that's far away that's even better. On the other hand, what you can do is you can do a high temperature search where you don't settle on any one answer. You bounce around the space looking at a whole lot of different possibilities. Um, that's more likely to bounce you out of that local minimum, give you a better answer. But of course, if you're just bouncing around the space all the time, you're not gonna actually settle on a solution for long enough to be able to put it into practice and to exploit. Um, and the solution, the simulated annealing solution is to start out with a high temperature search and then slowly cool off. So here's an example where if you, um, uh, if you start off, um, let's see, you start off around here, and if you were just doing the local search, you would be, sorry, if you start out here, if you were just doing the local search, you'd get stuck in this local optimum, right? Because it would look as if this was better than anything else that was close by. But if you do the larger search, if you start out by bouncing around, you'll find this other, uh, this other optimum. But then as you cool off, you'll actually be able to settle into the correct optimum. Um, so my hypothesis is that childhood is evolution's way of resolving this explore-exploit trade-off and performing something like simula simulated annealing. Um, so the idea is you start out in this protected space, you don't have to do anything, you don't actually have to exploit, you don't have to accomplish any goals, you have a, a range of caregivers who are uh, doing that for you, and that's a whole other interesting 
question about the evolution of this uh, caregiving, uh, the evolution of this caregiving function, interestingly, including uh, including grandmothers, postmenopausal grandmothers, but maybe we could talk about that later on. So you have this protected space with these caregivers, and that gives you a chance to do this kind of broad uh, exploration of the space. And then that is what enables us to be able to do well in different kinds of, uh, in different kinds of environments. Um, so that's kind of been the general hypothesis. And I will point out that at least if you <laughs> to have anyone who has a three-year-old at home working from home, and I describe, here's one way of being in the world, noisy, bouncy, all over the place, um, versus another way, which is being careful and, and focused, I think you'll have a sense of who sounds like they belong in each category. So from this perspective, many things that are uh, bugs from the perspective of exploitation and things that classically have been seen as bugs, things that made children irrational um, or incapable in various kinds of ways, are actually features from the perspective of exploration. And again, this is a, a point that, uh, that Sharon Thompson Schill here has made, for example. So things like being noisy, being variable, having a lot of randomness, noisy both literally and, and metaphorically, um, taking risks, being impulsive, um, playing, being curious. These are all examples of things that don't actually help to get resources or help to maximize your utilities, but that are extremely helpful from the perspective of uh, are extremely helpful from the perspective of exploration. And one of the things that we're doing now with, uh, with Bear, with our AI group, is actually seeing if we can design uh, computational systems, for instance, that play and are curious and impulsive in the same way that children are. And there's at least some evidence that when we do that, we end up with more robust learning than we would if we had the typical uh, kind of AI learning mechanisms that just involve being trained to one particular uh, one particular narrow optimization. Um, okay, so, so far this has all been a bunch of theory. I've given you 20 minutes worth of ideas. Do we actually have any evidence that this is true? Well, you know, most of the time, if you do a task with children and adults, adults are gonna do better at the task pre precisely because they've got these uh, executive function kinds of capacities, especially if you're thinking about something like a laboratory task where there's an answer that's the right answer. Adults are usually pretty good at figuring that out and they'll do a better job than, than children were and older children will do better than younger children. But there's actually this really interesting whole set of examples, some from our lab, some from other labs, uh, where children and younger learners are actually doing a better job than older learners. And almost all of those examples involve cases where uh, the solution is, um, is an unlikely or unusual one. And this first reference that I have here, this is a whole long line of research that my colleagues and I have, have done, where we looked, for instance, at the ability to learn unlikely causal um, relationships. Uh, and uh, that go, this Gopnik et al. 2017, a PNIS paper, kind of has the, has the, the broadest uh, review of this, this set of work. Um, and what we found was that children characteristically, preschoolers are better at understanding, at better at learning these unlikely hypotheses than older children and adults are. And this uh, paper, by the way, this went to et al. And that's even true if you're looking at, say, low ASES children, uh, children in uh, favelas in, in Peru, for example. Um, even though, a point I'll get back to in a minute, those children do not do as well on some of the classic measures of things like executive function or IQ. But there's a whole lot of other kinds of examples of this when you start looking. Um, and we've actually got some work that we're doing with Allison uh, in collaboration with Allison Mackey here, uh, looking at, for instance, a creative foraging task where there isn't a simple right answer and showing that the children seem to be more exploratory than the adults. So when you look more carefully, you can see that in these special cases where what you need to do is to explore more widely, there's some evidence that children are actually better than adults. And I'm gonna give you a new example of something from my lab that shows this. This idea about exploration and exploitation has been particularly well developed in the context of reinforcement learning. Um, so what we did was instead of a causal inference task, now we have a kind of causal inference slash reinforcement learning task. This is work with Emily Leakwood. And here's how it goes. We have the equivalent of our liquid detector. It's a machine that lights up and does things when you put some things on it and not others. 
Uh, except this time your job is to uh, either decide to put something on the machine or not put it on. So you either approach it or you avoid it. Um, and the setup is that, uh, so you have to make that decision. So the setup is, let, you, you guys can be participants in this, uh, in this experiment, although I guess I can't get you to raise your hands here. Um, so try and do this yourself. Here's the setup. Um, if something is a ZAF and it goes on my machine, um, then what will happen is that it'll, you'll get this nice green smiley face and you'll get a sticker, okay? So you put the first block on the machine and it turns out that it's a ZAF and sure enough, you get a sticker. Now you've got a new block. Now you have to decide, am I gonna try this on the machine or not? And this one has black stripes on it instead of white stripes and you put it on, oh no, that's not a ZAF and you're actually gonna lose two stickers. Now let's try again. Now we have the one with white dots. We put it on the machine. Oh, look, it's a ZAF and the machine lights up and now we get one sticker. Now here's the crucial test. What should we do now? So now we've got the block that has the black dots on it. Should you approach or should you avoid? And you can all sort of try and decide what it is that you think. Well, if you're taking the simplest, most obvious hypothesis would be something like, okay, ones that have white things on them are, are ZAFs, ones that don't have white things on them, ones that have black things on them are not ZAFs. That's a really simple hypothesis. So in that case, you should not put it on, you should avoid it because otherwise you're gonna lose the, um, you're gonna lose stickers and you'll lose more stickers for being wrong than you'll gain for being right. Um, so you might think the rational thing to do is to avoid it. But actually, in this case, the actual income outcome is that this is a ZAF. So this is actually going to give you reward. Um, and the trouble was that you settled too quickly on a particular, you settled too quickly on a particular hypothesis about how the system worked. And as a result of settling too quickly on that hypothesis, you, uh, you made a mistake. And this is, uh, there's a whole bunch of really beautiful work by, uh, there's, a, there's the structure of this problem by uh, Todd Gorekas, actually showing that adults get caught in what they call these learning traps. So what happens is that adults um, find this particular hypothesis. And then once, and of course the problem is once you've got the hypothesis, if you keep avoiding the ones that have the, uh, the black patterns on them, then you're never going to learn that you are wrong. Right? You're never actually going to learn about uh, a potential source of reward. Um, uh, so, uh, and there's a lot of evidence that these kinds of learning traps, and they're not just theoretical things that happen in the lab. For example, if you think about certain kinds of uh, psychopathologies, like phobias, for example, um, phobias are a good example of falling into this kind of learning trap. So, what happens when you have a phobia is, you know, you get on the plane and you have a terrible experience once, and as a result, you're scared, and that means you never get on the plane again. And as a result, you never actually learn that, oh no, that's not true, planes are actually okay. Um, and anxiety disorders in general seem to involve these kind of learning traps. So what we wanted to do was to figure out what happens when we put children in these circumstances. So we have four sets of these blocks. So I've just described the setup for you. Um, and first we looked at the approach avoid decisions that uh, the, the children were children and adults were making. We did this with adults, seven-year-olds and four-year-olds. And the adults, we replicated the Gorekas result. You can see that the, they avoid more as they go on, but you can also see that they miss about half of the potential uh, positive examples. So they're they're falling into this learning trap and they're avoiding things that are actually that actually are zaps and could give them reward. Um, the six to seven year olds are a bit less likely to do that. Um, and the four and five year olds, as you might expect if you know four and five year olds, um, although they're showing some sensitivity to the reward and we had some control conditions to show this, they're still overall approaching much more than the seven year olds or the adults are. Um, now, of course, the crucial question is, how about learning the actual rule, learning this unlikely two dimensional rule? So at the end of the experiment, we gave the children um, and the adults the the uh, the blocks and we said, okay, which one is a ZAF? Just tell me, is this one a ZAF? 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 And the question was, would they settle on the obvious rule, the more likely rule, the one dimensional rule, either it's stripes or it's spots or it's white or it's black, or would they have learned the more complicated two dimensional rule um, that say ZAFs are 
either things that are, uh, are white or things that are striped. And what we found was that um, you saw the same pattern in learning. So the adults were almost all just sticking with the one dimensional role. And as the children got younger, they actually were more likely to, uh, to find the accurate two dimensional rule. And I should say all of these experiments, in fact, all the experiments we do in our lab now were all uh, pre-registered with the data and the analyses before we actually did the experiment. Um, and then we replicated this experiment uh, uh, again, again, finding the same pattern. Um, so that suggests that the children are, oh, but Missing a slot. Now, interestingly, the children weren't actually getting more reward. In fact, the adults were still, in spite of the fact that they were, uh, they weren't learning the right uh, outcome, and they were, uh, and they were leaving some of the reward, as, as it were, on the table. Um, the adults were still getting more reward than uh, than the children were. So the children, again, this is this explore exploit trade off. The children. The children's impulsivity, the children's tendency to just to put things on the machine, um, was actually enabling them to learn more, but it wasn't necessarily uh, enabling them to exploit more. And by the way, again, we did a bunch of control conditions that showed that it wasn't that the children were just insensitive to the reward. So the children were more likely to put something on the machine when it was rewarding than when it wasn't rewarding, um, but they were more willing to be exploratory than the adults were. Um, okay, so let me do one more uh, study. So this study is consistent with a number of other recent studies that suggest that children are more exploratory and that helps them to learn even if it means that they don't do as well with reward. Now I wanna talk about a more recent study um, in which we've been raising this, uh, using this kind of approach to look at questions about flexibility. Now, if you've been hearing what I've been I've said so far, a kind of obvious objection, if you know the developmental psychology literature is, wait a minute, you're saying that children are more flexible than adults, but what about the whole literature about executive function and executive flexibility? So one of the things that we know is that children are really bad at executive function. And one kind of set of tasks in which they're bad at executive function are things like the, um, the DCC task that, uh, that Phil Zalazo and his colleagues have, where children seem to perseverate, they do something once, then they just continue to do it. They don't seem to be able to shift from one role to another, for example. And that might suggest that children are actually less flexible. Um, so what we've done in these two studies is try to see how flexible are children and are children going to be rationally flexible? Now, all these kind of executive cases like the, uh, the DCC, um, S, the developmental card sort task, um, involve what you might think of as executive flexibility. So for example, in the card sort task, what happens is, say you sort something according to color, and then the experimenter says, okay, now I want you to do something different. I want you to sort it according to shape. And uh, children have a hard time doing that. But of course, in the learning context, the kind of flexibility you need is different. So in the learning context, what happens is, say I start out believing that, uh, that you know uh, that the block with the black spots is going to make the thing go, and then I discover that that's not true. Um, that's a different kind of flexibility, a kind of bottom-up flexibility about my representations of the world have to be revised, as opposed to the kind of top-down flexibility that comes with executive function, where I can do something like say, okay, I'm going to do something different from the thing that I did, uh, the thing that I did before. And the first set of experiments that we did, this is with uh, Katie Kimura. Um, what we actually, my student Katie Kamara, um, in 2019, the first thing is that we showed that four-year-olds were actually very flexible uh, epistemically. And not only were they flexible, but they were rationally flexible. So if you gave them evidence for one rule, you gave them one trial that showed that there was evidence for one rule, but then four trials showing that there was evidence for another rule, they would switch to the new rule. Um, but if you just gave them, if you gave them four trials of evidence for one rule and then just one trial that showed that the rule had switched, they would not switch to the new rule. So like good Bayesians, they were considering how much data they had before they switched. But if the data suggested that their original hypothesis was wrong, um, they were flexible and they would uh, they would switch, even for these higher order rules, like rules about uh, color versus shape. And I'll give you an example of this in a minute. 
So in the new study, which is under review, uh, we wanted to see whether three-year-olds, who were the ones who really seemed to have these terrible executive function deficits, see whether three-year-olds could also show this kind of epistemic flexibility, and then empirically see how it was related to their um, uh, how it was related to their executive function uh, abilities. So here's the way the experiment goes. Um, what happens is that there's a, a belief revision task in which in one experiment you get one learning trial and four revision trials. In the second experiment you get the opposite, four learning trials and, and sorry, that should say one revision trial. Um, and then we also gave the kids the day-night task and this dimension, dimensional change card sort task and we did this with three-year-olds. So here's how the task works. Um, you see these two little faces, and what happens is you get to pick among all these different machines, and each of the machines has a shape on top of it. So, and we, the children get to pick, so it doesn't look as if we are setting up the task. They get to pick which machine they wanna try. So here's a machine with a blue circle on it. Here, the learning rule is gonna be shape, and the revision rule is gonna be color. Um, then what happens is they actually see that a round thing goes on the machine, uh, even though it's a different color and the machine lights up and plays music. And then they point to where the block belongs, see that's the right block. So they get a trial of that. And then we test to see whether they've actually learned this rule. So now we say, here's another machine and which one should we choose to, uh, to make this machine uh, play music? And they should choose the one with the same shape if they've learned the rule. Then in the revision phase, what happens is now we've got a new uh, machine. This is a uh, one with a green triangle. And now you see that rather than shape being the thing that makes the machine go, if you put the shape one on, it doesn't work. But if you put the um, if you put the color one on, it does work. And again, the children are pointing to where the where it goes. Then the children see three more trials like this, um, where the color rule works. And then they have a test trial where they have to decide what they think will make the machine go. And they um, uh, they should, at this point, they should pick the one that's the same color rather than the one that's the same shape. So the children have to switch from thinking in terms of shape and getting that right, and then thinking in terms of color. Um, we also gave them the day-night task, that's a executive function task where you have to say night when you see the sun or day when you see the moon. And we gave them this classic dimensional ch change uh, card sort task. Um, where you have to start out by uh, sorting these cards according to shape. And then, so you get six trials in which the experimenter says, so I want you to put ones that are the same shape in here. And then you switch to the experimenter saying, now we are gonna switch. Now I want you to um, sort them according to color. And we saw whether the children would switch from uh, shape to color. And we use the same uh, shape to color or color to shape in the uh, in the uh, belief revision task and in the um, in the um, card sort task. Um, so first of all, what you can see is that the children, even these three year olds, um, are quite good at this task. So we give them a choice between the revision rule, the learning rule, and the distractor. And in experiment one, where there's more evidence for the uh, revision rule than the learning rule, they pick the revision rule. In experiment two, where there's more evidence for the learning rule than the revision rule, they pick the uh, the learning rule. And again, that experiment two acts as a kind of control for experiment one, shows that they actually are paying attention to the uh, to the data. Um, and then they have a choice with uh, between that and a distractor. So even these very young children, these three-year-olds, are able to revise their beliefs when they get evidence that suggests that they should revise their beliefs. Um, there was no relationship at all, zero, between the children's performance on this uh, task and their performance on either the DCCS or the day-night task. Um, we thought there might even be a negative uh, uh, relationship given ideas about executive function. We did not find that, but we definitely found a zero relationship between the children's performance uh, uh, on the executive function tasks and their performance on, uh, on this belief revision task. And then the last thing that we did was, oops, sorry. Uh, the last thing we did, experiment three, we thought, well, was it something about the causal nature of this task that was responsible, or was it the epistemic nature of the task that was responsible? 
Um, so was it something about the fact that there was this thing that was causing the machine to, to go on that was leading the children to, to do better? Or was it the fact that they were getting information, they were getting data about how the system worked? So what we did was we changed the task. We've only done 16 three-year-olds before uh, COVID hit. Um, so that it was more like the DCCS. Now, instead of figuring out which machine will go or not, we simply ask the children, which block matches my block? So now, as in the um, DCCS, they have a, a kind of rule, a social rule to figure out uh, about which block is going to match the other block. Um, and in fact, what we found was that in this case, the children did even better. So the children were even more likely to get the revision rule when it was this kind of social rule rather than being a, rather than being a causal relationship. And the social rule is a little easier to, to track as well. So whether you did it as a social rule about matching or whether you did it as a causal relationship, um, when children were getting data about the role, so the, uh, the social rule task unfolded exactly like the causal task, it was just that when you put the right thing on, the experimenter said, see, now that's a match. Um, that the children were also good at doing the revision, even though in the DCCS, they, their performance was pretty much the way it always is when you were top down having to change a rule without having any data or evidence that that rule had changed. Um, okay, so it looks from these data as if there might be a real difference between the kind of epistemic flexibility, the kind of explore flexibility that we see in very young children. This capacity to consider a wide range of hypotheses, consider a wide range of say solutions to a, uh, solutions to a problem, um, and the kind of different kind of flexibility that's involved with executive function, the ability to say change your, um, change your attitude or change your solution depending on a kind of top-down, uh, depending on a top-down cue. Um, and that suggests that there might be quite different trajectories for the development of this kind of learning. And I think, again, that's consistent with the fact that we see children showing, you know, really remarkable capacities and even, even in infancy for things like, um, for things like statistical learning or language learning or intuitive theory learning, even though they have much more limited uh, kinds of executive capacities. And again, I think it speaks to this idea about a fundamental trade-off between these two kinds of intelligence and the idea that children are actually designed by evolution to enable you uh, to have this period in which these, these learning capacities, these exploration capacities are in place. And that might also suggest something about how we could design computational systems more effectively that have something more like this kind of architecture. And let me end by thanking my uh, collaborators, Tom Griffiths and Chris Lucas, who are the collaborators on the kind of computational part of this, and Emily Lee Quinn and uh, Katie Kimura, who were uh, the collaborators on the uh, on the empirical work, and of course the various um, and of course the various our, our various funders. So thanks very much and for your attention, and uh, and I'm happy to answer questions. Great, thank you so much, Allison, for, for that wonderful talk, um, and really cool to see some very new data um, on this topic. Um, we have a, a couple of questions that have come in, and so uh, they've both been upvoted, so I'll go in <laughs> order of which one is first. Um, so Lisa Miraci says, thanks for the great talk. Simulated annealing solves the problem of getting stuck in local maxima by introducing random exploration. But isn't it plausible that children's exploration isn't totally random? Yeah. In instead, isn't it plausible that it involves semantic and explanatory connections, indeed creative ones? If so, then how seriously can we take the simulated anne annealing uh, analogy? Um, okay. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the crucial, I could have had a sort of further question slide, I guess. I think the crucial question to ask now is, how much is, what's the balance be between random exploration and directed exploration? And in the adult literature about things like reinforcement learning in these pretty simple contexts, um, there's some evidence that both things happen. So you have both directed exploration and random exploration in combination in adults. And we certainly have a lot of evidence, including uh, work that we've done in, in my lab, uh, that children's exploration is not random, that they're actually being quite 
systematic about exploring in areas where they're going to be more likely to get more information. Um, we have a beautiful study with Azura uh, Ruggieri and Eric Schultz. Uh, get to open up doors. Um, there's these closed doors. And uh, we, had just, we had just a little bit of a lag, Allison. No. So I'm going to ask you to start your description of the study one more time. Okay, great. So the way the study goes, it's very simple, but very elegant. So there's these doors and the kids can open up doors to find something out. And in one condition, you just say, there's a lion behind these doors. Um, and you can find out the lion, see if you can find the lion. In the other condition, you say, there's eight different animals behind these doors. It might be a lion, it might be a bear, etc. Now you can open the doors to find the animals. And in the second condition where there's more information to be gained, the children are much more likely to be persistent in opening the doors, even if they don't find something. Um, and there's lots of other really elegant examples in my lab and others of the fact that children are not just randomly exploring. On the other hand, they are sort of randomly exploring. So when we look at the uh, when we look at the kids in our um, in our approach avoid task, for example, they're you know even when we tell them here's the rule, they're still kind of going out and trying things in a kind of impulsive three year old way. And I think the real interesting challenge now is exactly to figure out what's the relationship, what's the balance between the noise and randomness and then this direction. And that's the thing that, by the way, that uh, current AIs don't really have a capacity to do. So, you know, if you tell them beforehand, here's how to solve the problem, they can do it. If you just give them a bunch of data, they can do it. But putting those two things together in a creative way, I think is really the challenge. And I think that's the thing that, that young kids are so brilliant at doing. Great, thank you. Our second question is um, from Laura Zaneski, and she says, awesome talk. Something about human development and risk-taking is that it seems um, uh, that risk-taking peaks in adolescence. Yeah. Do you think that this is not due to exploration, but another factor? Or would you argue, argue that children are higher risk-takers, but are sheltered by caregivers so that they don't have as much, as much opportunity uh, to have higher risk taking compared to adolescence. Yeah, I, adolescence is fascinating. And in that PNAS paper that I mentioned, the 2017 one, one of the things that we did was we actually tracked the development of this exploration from preschool all the way up through school age to adolescence to adulthood. And what we discovered was that in the kind of fiscal task, like this one with the blicket detector with a machine, um, what you saw was that children became less exploratory when they were about seven, sort of in the school age transition. Then they stayed that way. There wasn't any change up till adolescence. And then they became even less exploratory in adolescence. But if you took a, did a social task, not a physical task, so a task about figuring out people, then you saw this big peak in adolescence. So the children became less exploratory as school age children, but then the most exploratory people were the adolescents and then less exploratory in adulthood. So I think you're exactly right. I think there's a lot of reason to think that adolescence is like this. If you think about the uh, simulated annealing analogy, one of the things that happens with annealing, both in metallurgy and in computer science, is you do rounds of annealing. So you anneal and then you settle down and then you anneal again and then you settle down. And I think one way of thinking about adolescence is, especially for things like social action, where that's really going to have consequences, the adolescents are the ones who are uh, who are exploring that space and taking risks. And I think you're exactly right. The risks don't kind of hit us as being risks when it's a three-year-old, because the three-year-old is designed to have caregivers who are making sure that they're not taking risks. Uh, there's beautiful work that people here probably know about by Neem Tottenham, for example, and work with uh, with primate, with um, rodents, that shows that the young rodents, for example, are willing to go down the arm of the maze that leads to uh, that leads to a shock, sort of surprisingly, right? They actually prefer to do that, but they only do that when the caregiver is there. So it's like they they're sort of saying, and this is true both for mice and for um, and for children in 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 Nim's work. It's as if the caregiver is a signal that okay, these risks are not actually that risky. Um, and I think, of course, the difference with adolescence is with adolescents, the risks really are risky. Great. All right, our next question is from Angie Cow, who asks, thank you so much for the talk. I'm curious about your thoughts on the classic, um, let's see, my 
thing just jumped around. I'm very curious about your thoughts on the classic Hunter and Ames model, where they are suggesting that older infants show a novelty preference faster than younger infants in, hab in a habituation study. Can that finding be understood as older infants are more exploratory than younger infants? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And my colleague, uh, Celeste Kidd, has done this really beautiful work looking at the relationship between information content and, um, and looking time, for instance. So we take for granted the fact that, oh, OK, infants look at things that are unlikely or surprising. Um, but that's really fascinating. I mean, that's a really interesting thing about infants. Um, you know, we use that as a method for figuring out what they think, but it's a really interesting thing about infants. And I think what um, what Celeste has found is that there's this kind of sweet spot of something, and this gets back to the original question about, uh, Lila's question about, uh, you know, directed versus random exploration. There's this kind of sweet spot of where the information, you're getting new information, but you're not getting something that's completely random. And the babies seem to be, uh, narrowing in on that sweet spot. And of course, as you know more, as you understand more, that sweet spot is going to shift, right? So it may be that early in development, something that's just a small change from what you're already seeing is captivating. Later on, it needs to be something that's bigger, more surprising to actually lead you to explore. And again, there's beautiful work by Lisa, Amy Stahl and Lisa Feigenson showing that that's true, uh, showing that that's true for older children. Uh, that's true for older children as well. So I think I think there's there's definitely a link to the looking time literature and a lot of what's going on in, in uh, the development of looking time can be explained or at least seems to reflect this idea that you're exploring. But you're not just randomly exploring, you're exploring based on some idea about something like information gain. Um, wonderful. All right. Our next uh, question is from Sarah Solomon, who asks, who says, really great talk. You mentioned conceptual change in one of your slides, but it wasn't further discussed. Can you speak a bit about, speak a bit more to how explore exploit trade-offs and bottom up versus top down influences on belief flexibility might relate to conceptual change in children and adults? Yeah, I think that's also a great question. And I, I, I in fact, I was trying to decide when I was giving my, putting this talk together, whether to do the conceptual change talk or the explore exploit uh, talk. Um, so if you think about conceptual change, of course, what you need for conceptual change is to be able to search this space. And particularly, I think something that's particularly interesting in the simulated annealing literature in, um, in AI and computation is that the way that simulated annealing works, again, think about this high dimensional space, is that first you're searching the, the, the high level features of the space. So if you think about the space as say having some kind of hierarchical structure where there are sort of big general principles, you might think of them as being like the paradigm or over hypotheses or uh, you know uh, uh, high level theories. Um, you first search that space, and that's what uh, that's what the high temperature search lets you do. And then you can narrow in to uh, once you, once you kind of know what ballpark you're in, then you can narrow in and work out the details. And I think exactly what goes on in conceptual change is being able to search that high level space. And traditionally, the way that we thought about development often is, okay, well, you start out by getting small, detailed, empirical information at the low level, and then you gradually accumulate that, and then let, that lets you have conceptual change at the high level. But it may be that part of what's going on is that um, and there's some work by Noah Goodman that suggests this, you might do better by starting out bouncing around this high level space and then coming in and uh, working out the details. And I think one uh, thing that our, uh, one result that our findings suggest is that when children are exploring, uh, they're exploring this high level space. It's interesting, for instance, in our look at detector studies that I mentioned, if you just are doing, you know, is this block making the machine go or not? you don't see much developmental change. If anything, the older kids are a little better because they you know, pay attention more and so forth. The place where you see the younger kids doing better is when you're doing things like, well, does this machine work on a conjunctive principle or on a disjunctive principle? Or is it a two-dimensional hypothesis or a one-dimensional hypothesis? So I think, I think exactly the idea would be that this would speak to conceptual change. And it would suggest that if you're thinking about adults, for example, um, that the kinds of things, and I think there's some evidence for this, if you want conceptual change in adults, one thing is 
make the stakes low. So don't put people in a situation in which they're going to have to exploit, make the stakes low, put people in a playful, optimistic um, context, and, and maybe introduce people who don't have as strong priors, don't have as much background knowledge. Great, I, I think this next question um, flows nicely off of that. Um, it's, there's no name, but they say, thank you for a great talk. Would it be possible that children are exploratory because they cannot commute, compute or they are not sensitive to the opportunity costs of exploration and the environment? And so that maybe uh, relates to what you were just saying about um, creating these environments to, to facilitate exploration. That's right. So, I mean, one of the questions that we're asking now, so we have a, a really cute, Emily Sumner has a really, a really nice, um, design um, that I'm very curious about. Like if we take six and seven year olds, now if they're actually exploiting for a younger child, for example, so we have uh, Celeste, the adorable three-year-old comes in and says, I want the stickers, can you help me get the stickers? Um, will that actually lead them to be more exploitative? So in other words, is part of the reason why they're not exploiting just because they don't understand about exploiting or is it because they think, well, I'm in a safe environment, I have a caregiver, I can explore, but wait a minute, now I'm supposed to be doing something to help someone else, especially someone else who's vulnerable, now I should uh, exploit. And it's, a not, I don't know what's gonna happen, but it's a nice hypothesis that the kids might actually be better at exploiting for somebody else than they are for themselves because their assumption is that they don't really need to exploit, they'll be, uh, they'll, be, uh, they'll be taken care of. I don't know how that's, I don't know how that's gonna, uh, I don't know how that's gonna work out. But I should emphasize again, when we did the explore exploit, the approach avoid task, we had a bunch of manipulation checks and control conditions that showed the children, it wasn't that the children didn't know about the stickers. So if we ask them, you know, which one is gonna, what's gonna happen if you put this block on the machine, are you gonna get stickers or lose stickers? They definitely knew which ones were gonna make them um, lose or gain stickers. And they cared about the stickers. They were disappointed when they lost the stickers. Yes, so stickers are an amazing motivator for kids in these tasks. All right, I think um, we're just about at one, but since we started a couple of minutes late, I will go ahead and ask you the last question we have here. Um, and this one is from Dan Swingley and says, fascinating, what is the crucial difference between the change information provided in your new task so that the child discovers or experiences the change and where the child discovers or experiences the change and information in the DCCS, which is less effective, mm -hmm. where the child uh, is maybe informed linguistically about the change. Is it volition, the evidence or the timing? Kind of maybe you can speculate. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, the important difference, which, we, which really hit us when we started doing the DCCS is in the DCCS, you have no evidence. So no one ever gives you any feedback about the change. You just get told that the, that, the, that there's a change. And also the change, the, an, interesting thing to, um, an interesting thing to check is the change isn't introduced as a change in the, the rule or a change in the way it works. So it isn't that the experimenter says, now we're gonna use a new rule. The experimenter just says, now I want you to sort, or now there's a new rule. The experimenter just says, now I'm gonna sort it. Uh, now I want you to sort it differently. But I think the really important thing is the feedback. So in our task, what happens is, you say, here's the matching rule, let's see what happens. Oh, it matched, oh, it didn't match. Now we're gonna put it in the corner here and I'll show you, here's the smiley face and here's the sad face. And then you generalize as opposed to not having any of that, um, uh, not having any of that uh, feedback and evidence. But but I'm not sure, I mean, there might be other features of the tasks, uh, there might be other features of the task as well. One thing is, it's not the color and shape, it's not the abstractness of the rule. The kids are fine at dealing with the abstract rule. And we sort of thought, we have some other findings looking at things like analogy, where the causal context really does seem to make it much easier than uh, a non-causal context. Uh, so we thought maybe it was the causality that was making the difference, but it doesn't seem to be the causality. It really seems to be about, do you have feedback and do you have evidence for the change? Or is it just something that you're imposing? Uh, is it just something that you're imposing uh, top down? Great. Well, it's it's lovely to hear a little bit about your thought process behind this. I know we are getting right at one o'clock, so um, I think I will turn it over to Heather to officially end, um, but we can all, um, say thank you again, uh, Dr. Allison. Thank, thank you for the great questions.
Thank you very much. Um, so we will sign off now. I just want to put a reminder out to our audience that a recording of this talk will be available shortly after this ends. And then I've already posted that um, next week's speaker will be Stephen Roberts um, from the Department of Psychology at Stanford. We will be speaking on something that feels particularly relevant in Philadelphia and in the United States right now, which is um, he'll be talking about racism, uh, a developmental story. So please join us next week at noon for that. And thank you again. Thank you so much to you both. Uh, Rista, do you know will the pub public talk be generally publicly applicable? Should I link to it or is it just for people at PEP? You're welcome to link to it. It's available for anyone. Great, okay, good. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you.